while Hellraiser Judgment was greenlit purely as a rights retainer, like the maligned Hellraiser Revelations before it, many found the movie itself to be surprisingly not bad. Fans were highly critical of the decision to recast Pinhead again, as most didn't appreciate the outcome last time that was tried. As such, stepping into the role Doug Bradley originated surely must be a daunting challenge to any actor taking on the role. Joining myself and Tom Connors to discuss just that is the new Pinhead himself, Paul T. Taylor. Hey guys, how you doing? Tom, why don't you make the introductions? Paul T. Taylor is a Dallas-based actor with an impressive resume of roles played in regional theaters, as well as Lincoln Center in New York and the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. He has also had several film and television appearances, including Sin City, Super, W, and TV shows like Friday Night Lights and Prison Break. He perhaps is most well-known for taking on the role of the iconic pinhead in Hellraiser Judgment. Although at the outset, Paul faced a fan base that was very skeptical at the prospect of anybody but Doug Bradley taking on the role, many were positively surprised by his take on the Hellpriest after seeing Hellraiser Judgment. Before we get into that, when did you know you wanted to become an actor and how did you break into acting as a profession? I grew up watching my dad do a lot of community theater. It was in his blood, but because he was brought up during the Depression, he put himself through dental school instead and uh, did community theater instead of being a professional actor. His dad was in vaudeville, so it was sort of in my blood. But watching my dad do community theater at Hutchinson Little Theater in, in Hutchinson, Kansas, that's when I first saw theater. and. Um, I knew that I wanted to try it because he was getting laughs and uh, I like making people laugh. And so I did a play. I was just a kid. And it was the first time I think in my life where I just knew that I'd found my place. I'd found my church, as it were. At the time, it was probably all about look at me, love me, look at me, love me. But, uh, you know, it's evolved over the years and become more art than just completely selfish sort of reasons for doing it but I, I just took to it you know like a duck to water to answer the second part of the question it was really several years later that i wanted to be a professional actor it was really a pretty easy um transition i just i i, I was in college and i auditioned for um a touring children's theater and so i started in children's theater touring just regionally around the states I'm sticking pretty close to the home base of Kansas. And I did that for several years and moved to Wichita, Kansas and was there for several years. Then when I moved to Dallas, it's when I first um, started getting my equity week so that I could become a member of the union. And I had moved to Dallas because it was being called the Third Coast at the time. And I believed that. So I moved here and there's a lot of theater here. It's a theater town, definitely. And I, I didn't plan to still be here 25, 30 years later, but I just sort of found a base here. I've lived in other places and, and pursued theater in New York. So my professional life started around college and then, but then I didn't really become a full-time actor until I moved down to Dallas in the late eighties. Now it seems like you first started off in a few smaller roles on television and smaller films, but then your first big movie experience would have been Sin City, correct? Yeah, that was my first movie was Sin City. My agent sent me down to Austin to audition for Robert Rodriguez and I made him laugh with my reenactment of getting my arm broken in three places yeah that was my first my first thing and it was the coolest it was just wow such a huge picture and it was very cool and then there, there's a, a casting director in oklahoma city who actually was the casting director for hellraiser judgment who over the years several years has gotten me cast in some some independent films and um several commercials and like a horror film called the gray man which is based on albert fish who was a, a real serial killer who was a, who liked to kill children and then eat them so you know this has nothing to do with your question but there you go <laughs> no that's amazing so i mean you've obviously worked with great directors like oliver stone james gunn so i mean you've had a pretty extensive career up to this point even though most people may not recognize you up front it's not like you just popped onto the scene and started with Pinhead. How much did you really get to work with James Gunn? How fun was that? No, it was great fun. I mean, it was it's a it's a pretty short scene. I mean, it's just in the introduction of the movie, and I'm just basically spanking uh, baby Rain Wilson uh, <laughs> with a belt, and I have, I think one line. But it was cool. I remember the audition very vividly because I just from reading the description, 
I had these eye distorting eyeglasses that because I collect eyeglasses for auditions and for roles. And I figured this guy was just this super conservative religious zealot just because of his line in the in the film, you know, wore my high waisted khakis and and my button down short sleeve shirt and big belt and just super nerdy. So I go into the and had my hair slicked down and I go into the audition. Being t I didn't take the glasses off, and I'm, I won't talk to anybody. Because, I mean, it, for me, personally, if I feel like I can really nail something, then I, I just want to be in the waiting room before the audition, just, just focusing on that. I can just be the guy when I walk in. I made James Gunn laugh, you know? And he, <laughs> I think he might have decided right then, this is the guy. Um, I mean, it, I don't remember. I, don't, I think it was the original audition. I don't think there was a callback. I think I just went over there and auditioned directly for him. I'm not real sure. And then the experience on the set was very was was pretty short, um, but I did get to meet Rain Wilson. And in the makeup trailer, I got to sit next to Liz Tyler while she's on the phone chatting to someone. She is, is angelically beautiful. But shooting the actual scene, it was very quick, and he knew exactly what he wanted. We did several takes, and and I was done. So it was that was a very you know it's a highlight, very brief experience though. Those once in a while you just get those. So you obviously had quite the extensive career before you got into Hellraiser. Can you tell us exactly how did that come about? I got an email from my agent saying that they wanted to put me on tape for the, the role of the auditor. And the first line I read of the auditors, I knew it was a Hellraiser movie. It was being kept a secret that it was a Hellraiser film. But his first line is, we have such sights to show you. And I thought, this is a Hellraiser film. And then I got a private email about just auditioning for the role of Pinhead. And so it blew my mind that I was going to be auditioning for that role. And I didn't know how good the odds were. But I had four days to prepare. And I decided it was going to be the best film audition I'd ever done in my life because this kind of thing this kind of opportunity i knew was the universe responding to the fact that i'd love horror so much and pinhead was always my favorite horror icon from the 80s so i decided it would be the best film audition i'd ever done and those four days were a blessing because it, there was a lot of text to learn for the audition so i went in i got put on tape for both roles and i didn't have a callback at all that initial audition tape went to gary tunnicliffe the you know the writer director and i heard back from the casting director that i was his first choice and that i was on hold for the role but i had to get approval from the studio and you know all the execs and then ultimately bob weinstein it took a little while for me to finally get the word and it's weird how it seems like it was really easy to get it i mean after decades of being a working actor it wasn't an overnight thing and it wasn't easy but when it finally lined up and was happening it was sort of perfect it was just perfect and suddenly boom there we are we're doing the head cast we're getting the makeup started flew out to la to get a, do a costume fitting and uh, do an audition with an actress who was auditioning for the role of joe fields she didn't ultimately get it but it was wild and suddenly i'm on this wild ride where i'm introduced into the world of doug bradley and the franchise and the history and it was just wonderful it's so cool now, you said, uh, of course, you were a fan of Pinhead. In fact, you said he was your favorite horror icon. We, when we talked to Gary, he said you had showed up with a figure of Pinhead. Is that true? So we started casting, and I saw lots of tape, and Paul Taylor had done a reading of The Auditor. And he was really sweet, because he'd bought in like a Hellraiser cube and a little figure of Pinhead. And he said, I know what this is for. Because at that point, we were just calling it judgment. We didn't want to alert anybody that we were doing a Hellraiser movie because um, we just wanted to keep it really quiet. The, the working title was always going to be judgment and Pinhead was never in the listings or anything else. But people were doing the assessor's reading and the first line from the assessor was, come inside, we have such sites to show you. And he'd spotted it. So he was kind of like smiling on the thing and holding his Pinhead going, I know what this is, I know what this is. And, Yes, it was still a secret. I mean, nobody else knew that it was a Hellraiser movie, except those other actors who were specifically auditioning for Pinhead. So yeah, I took my Pinhead action figure from Nika, and I took my little Nika Hellraiser box in a bag so no one would see them. I walk into the room, and um, I pull them out, and I'm like, hey. Chris said, you know, you can hold that 
Hellraiser box if you want to for your audition. And I said, no, I don't want to because I did not, I didn't rehearse with it. So I think that might throw me off. I just wanted to do the audition. So I did hold it for my slate, right? At the end of the audition where I was like, hi, I'm Paul T. Taylor. I'm from Dallas. I'm 5'11". And I'm sure that's not why I got cast, but I'm sure that Gary saw that and was like, whoa, this guy. And it's crazy because Gary was a creative consultant on the action figures, something I didn't learn until later when I was reading the back of, of one of the packages. And I thought that was very cool too. I love those figures. They're so great. But yeah, I've had Hellraiser action figures for years. I love the Angelique. Oh my God, so cool. But I love them all. And now I have all of them, including a, a working 18-inch chatterer where the teeth still work, which is very hard to find. But yeah. After you landed the role, did you do something else to really get yourself more acquainted with Hellraiser than you already were? Like, how did you research for the role? Well, I started out by watching all of the Hellraiser films. I didn't have all of them on DVD, and I'm not even sure that I had seen all of them. I think that I had seen all of them, but, you know, some of the later films are not as memorable as the first few. So I started watching all of them, as, of course, specifically watching Doug Bradley's work so that I could soak up what, you know, what I already knew knew he'd done but really actually study him and I did that for a few weeks and then Gary and I agreed that it was probably best that I stop doing that that I you know start working on doing my own thing because the script is a little different than I think any of the other films in that it introduces a pinhead that is maybe based more in the Scarlet Gospels or some of the other attitudes that pinhead has had over the years describing as older and a little more jaded there's a story from Boom Comics and Hell Priest is on a horse and I think his first line is something about being lead center by in hell is not always cracked up to be. That whole attitude was something that had never been in another Hellraiser film. And so taking that and going with that because it seemed to be part of what the judgment lead Cenobite was a starting place for him. So just having all of that to go with, I sort of started concentrating on if I was going to watch films as research, then there were going to have to be films that were not Hell Priest, but that were going to have to be sort of jaded villains who were extremely centered and a, maybe a bit bored with the work. So I started watching a few classic films like Anthony Hopkins. I was really digging Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs and uh, Ray Fiennes, his character in uh, Schindler's List to work on the coldness. You know, that was all external stuff. It had to come from inside. So I started doing my own thing where I would just sit in my house with the lights out and sit on the porch smoking and just say the lines and take long walks in this scary neighborhood and with my heavy boots and just concentrating on sort of the mantra, I am pinhead, you can't kill me, etc. Basically building a lack of fear from the inside because you have to be a stone cold to be a hell priest and just do your work. So that's basically what I worked on so that by the time we got to filming, I knew where I was gonna be because when you know what you're going to look like, then that takes care of a large part of it because looking like that, you're already scary. You don't really have to do anything to be scary except internal work. How was seeing yourself in the makeup for the first time? It was fantastic. I mean, it was surreal. But th the thing is, it wasn't like what Doug Bradley went through because, you know, I basically knew what I was going to look like. But having said that, when I got back to the trailer and could really get up close to the mirror, because I'm basically blind and I, you know, if I'm not wearing my glasses or contact lenses, then I, I couldn't really see it while they were applying it. So I'd lean forward, which I, we didn't really have time for me to lean forward and look at it while he was doing it. But when I got back to the trailer and really was able to see it in the dim light of the trailer, and then I could see it and just realize that I was this grotesque monster, which was my fondest thing to be and has been since I was a kid trick-or-treating, you know, it was surreal. And I had to really look at it, just trying to visualize it as being real. Because when you're wearing it, you know it's not real, you know, everyone knows it's not real, but if I can believe it's real, and the pain that comes from that, and then I had to go from there and realize that the pain of these nails in my head are actually quite pleasurable in a way. It's kind of a mind trip because it has to all be imagined, because it's, you know, you don't really have nails in your head, but just looking at it and seeing that it was the coolest thing that had ever happened to me i was in this place i was just in this place where hollywood uh, professionals had applied this monster makeup to me and i was about to be hell priest and just that alone it was just 
n like nothing I'd ever felt before. I was pretty much in ecstasy, <laughs> in a way. So yeah, at least you had the luxury, though, of having Gary work on the makeup, though, at least, right? He designed it. He didn't apply it because he was busy directing the film. But he did come in after it had actually all been glued on and most of the painting had been done and he tweaked it, which is wonderful to have a guy in the auditor makeup doing <laughs> my makeup. It was pretty wild. And there's a picture out there on the internet that's pretty funny of auditor without his glasses on painting Pinhead. So he would come in and he would finish the makeup and make sure that it looked perfect. And it was his idea also at the end of the film to paint the grids on for my last scene um, because I had shaved my head for the film not only so that the application of the makeup would be easier and also for that very last scene in the film it was my idea I, you know i asked him i said do you, do you want me to shave my head for that and he thought it was a great idea and i'm glad that i did because i think it's cool to have this human man with yeah, with no hair i think it's fitting and the reason i bring that up is because he was away working on scream 4 when they were doing revelation so obviously at least he was on board for this one yeah yeah, he wasn't able to do that makeup and also help Priest's costume in Revelations. He wasn't able to make sure that that neck was tight and that it, it looked right. But, you know, these things happen. But, yeah, speaking of the costume, you got your own unique design, did you not? I did, yeah. And, and his idea was that because I am not Doug Bradley and because I am, I guess, not Elliot Spencer. And the whole idea from all of the other, you know, iterations of Hellraiser stories, from the comic books, etc., where they're not all the same. You know, Harry Lamore has become Hell Priest. You know, Kirstie Cotton has become Hell Priest. So it can look different. And also he did what he wanted to do with it. I remember the first time he pointed to the diamond shaped or the Leviathan shaped gash in my chest. And he pointed at it and he just goes, Order of the Gash. I'm like, yeah, I like it. Order of the Gash. That's a big old gash. Yes. And in the shape of Leviathan, which I thought was very cool. And um, imagining that pain of having your rib cage exposed. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And his own little personal tweaks like the Doctor Strange design in there and thought it was very cool and the raggedy robe. Just being able to do his own thing and the full length you know, chain metal butcher's apron. I thought that was very cool. I, I was very pleased when he said I was gonna have my own design. And he said, he has. I heard him say later that it was like, yeah, and if Paul does really well, then we'll have action figures and we'll know which one is which. Which, you know, from your lips to God's ears, that, that would be the coolest thing in the world to be an action figure. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, the, I thought the design was amazing. And when we were trying on contact lenses, we tried on like a half sclera, which still re showed a lot of the whites of my eyes. And I don't know, I, I liked it, but I just didn't think it quite did it. Of course, I didn't have the makeup on at the time. I just had the contacts in. And he's like, well, let's try the full sclera. And he put that one in. And I go back and look at it, and I'm like, yeah, I like this one a lot. He goes, yeah, no soul. I'm like, yes. Awesome. So, and since then, like last night, I was watching 30 Days of Night. That's the name. Yeah. 30 Days of Night. Yeah. Could have been filmed in my location. Yeah. Such a good movie. Oh, man. Those bloodsuckers are so cool. And the full black sclera contact lenses. And I mean, that kind of monster, that kind of makeup. I yearn to play uh, Mar a character, not Marlowe. It's already been done. But, but a monster, a vampire that looks something like Marlowe and just so super cold with those full black scleras. I just, I love it. I love that stuff. So you got your own pinhead design, which is pretty cool. How was shooting the movie? Do you have any cool stories from the set? I don't know how cool it is, but it's just definitely a story. I mean, it's funny now in retrospect, and uh, Gary has told this story too, but what happened was I started smoking for the role because I wanted to have my voice lower, not realizing that they were going to be modifying it anyway. And and also not realizing that, you know, it takes years of smoking to really make your voice like Brenda Vaccaro or somebody. So, but I, I was smoking. It was helping me get into the role, whatever. Be, and Gary had mentioned that there's always one line in the Doug Bradley films, at least one line, where when hell priest speaks smoke comes out of his mouth and it's very chilling and it's beautiful and it's cool and and people love it well doug was a serious smoker back then so when he was doing this close-up he would have a cigarette in his hand anyway and he'd just take a drag and he'd say the line and the smoke would come out and it'd be perfect and they could move on and that would become like a classic line from the film well 
that's something that we wanted to do. So I, so I'm smoking, and Gary says, "Can you do this?" And I said, "Yes, I can do this." So I have my cigarette, and I'm trying this line, and it's the line, "Evil seeks evil," and I'm. The smoke is just not coming out right, and Gary keeps having me try it. No, do it again. Like suck it right, real deep down into your lungs, and then start it blowing out, and then say the line. Well, that didn't work. Or just hold it in your mouth and say it. Well, that didn't work. It's puffing. So, eventually, Gary just I just start feeling so sick. I mean, I started having a nicotine overdose, and I felt like such an idiot. And we hadn't gotten the line right yet. And Gary looks at me, and he's like, he could even tell through the makeup to see that I was. Green. I mean, I was just, you know, I was not doing well. So he he said, Paul, Paul, leave the set, go outside, and it had to move on and shoot something else because it was a low budget film anyway. And so they had to, you know, everything had to be tight. And so I'm sitting out there on some steps of the trailer, and they had to loosen my neck thing because it was so tight anyway, and I couldn't breathe. And I don't know if you guys have ever had a nicotine overdose, but it is horrible. I mean, I'd never had one before, and I've never had one since. I haven't had a cigarette since for two years now because I couldn't breathe. I was panicked. I thought I'd ruined the movie. All these crazy things in my head, just thinking I'm never going to work again. You know, it's stupid thing, the things to think, but when it's happening and you're in this panic, it was just, it was just horrible. So that was not a cool story, but still, it's something that happened. And then, then we went back a couple days later and and used a vaporizer. And the crew member was like, "I, this is cherry flavor. The actual nicotine is down to zero. And so try that. And we did it. And I don't know if it worked or not because when you see the film. Actually, I say the line, and there's no smoke, which is, you know, I was disappointed in that, but I guess it just didn't work. But we had to move on. So yeah, maybe that will remain a Doug Bradley trope. Maybe so. Maybe so. Yeah. About that, we need to, of course, address the elephant in the room. Namely, this is a role that originated with Doug Bradley, and many are very clear that this role belongs to Doug Bradley. And even director Gary J. Tonicliffe himself has said that. Doug Bradley is his preferred pinhead, and he wrote the movie with Doug Bradley in mind. How does it feel stepping into those shoes, knowing that soul stacked against you? Yeah, I wasn't worried about it. It it didn't hurt my feelings or anything when I heard Gary say that, because if I were in Gary's shoes and I had that relationship with Doug for all those years, I would have felt the same thing. I mean, he said that it would have been very cool to either direct Doug. Or do scenes with Doug, and for Doug to say, "Wow, that was really cool. That was fun." You know, that would have been really the ultimate, I would think, for Gary, being such a seriously hardcore Clive Barker and Hellraiser fan. So I only worried about it for a little while. I mean, it was one of the first things that Gary spoke to me about was this history and how I was going to have some fans who were not going to be on my side, and that. This was something that I was gonna have to deal with, but Doug has been nothing but lovely about me because he realizes, you know, that it was a foregone conclusion that if he didn't play the role, someone else was gonna play it. I mean, obviously, he's an intelligent man, and I just sort of had to get over that because if I didn't just get over that, then I was going to be doubting my every move as far as my hell priest. So it did set me up for some worry after the film was shot because I had two years to wait before before I shot it to when it actually came out, and my biggest fear was that the people were going to tear me apart as Pinhead, that the fans were going to say, "See, we were right. Nobody else can play Pinhead but Doug Bradley, and this guy sucks." But the relief that I have felt recently since the film has come out. Has been massive because that's not what has happened. Because I, as I said, two years to think about that and to obsess about that. If I chose to obsess about it, which sometimes Paul T. Taylor will obsess, sometimes he will overthink. I mean, I, it's been one of my biggest issues as an adult person trying to evolve into a, you know, emotionally healthy guy. But、um, I've had some some wonderful things said to me since the films come out, and I know that there are still going to be the trolls and the haters who, no matter what, they're. Going to have nothing but、uh, negative things to say, and maybe they want to see drama, and when, maybe they want to cause drama, maybe they want to, maybe they're jealous. You never know what pe- you never know where people are coming from when they're on the internet the, saying things from the safety of their homes. You never know what their issues are, how much pain they're in. So I just have to continue focusing on the positive, and 
uh, know that I did the best I could do in the given situation with the time we had, with the money we had, and with what I was given. The talent I was born with and the drive I've always had to create something of my own. I really wanted to do my own Pinhead and I was encouraged by Gary to do that. So I feel good about what I've done and I'm not worried about fans. I, I was, but now I'm not at all. I think everything is good. One final question. In the event that there is a sequel to Hellraiser Judgment, and you had a say in deciding the story, where would you go? You know, I've thought, of course, thought about this a lot, and I really think that it would be a direct sequel from Judgment. Not that it would have to start happening immediately where Judgment ends. I think that the character of, I'm just going to say every man, because I'm not necessarily Elliot Spencer, but the character of every man who I am at the end of the film, with all the knowledge that he has, that, and the intelligence, and uh, the training, and the ability to use the, the ment configuration, the skills, his skill set, and his, you know, really, he's, he's a bit of an evil, um, you know, there's, there's definitely ego there. He's got to learn from that, from what happens in Judgment, and come back with so much power Maybe the film starts with him homeless. Maybe the film starts with him a few years later. He started a religion. He started his own cult. Or he, he works for a corporation. Or he's, he's in politics. Somehow, perhaps, he has become a more powerful being. And he's on his way. He's on this search to find one of those houses. To find a lament configuration. Or to perform such heinous acts that he has to come before whichever entity has be, now become uh, the, the lead center by. He has to be judged himself so that he can find his way back to the position he once held. I think that there are many possibilities for that. I also think that using characters from Judgment would be really great, like the Auditor, like Jophiel perhaps. I mean, she's an angel. She may have been torn apart, but it doesn't mean she can't be in uh, human or a a angelic form before and come back to Earth. And, you know, as so many other Hellraiser stories have shown, and which I've mentioned before, you know, anyone can be the lead Cenobite. So I think that there could be a great battle. Or, I mean, I have a lot of ideas, so I'm sorry you only asked for one, but I have a lot of ideas. It's possible that it could be a story of this everyman and his quest being a major part of it. But, of course, you have to have the other story that's been introduced, the, the story of the Auditor and that faction, because that is so interesting and warrants a lot more exploration, I think. They need to be linked somehow, and that there's some sort of quest on the part of the everyman to regain his power again. So we've had a heck of a conversation here with Paul T. Taylor. We want to thank you for your time with us here at Midnight's Edge, and maybe we'll get a chance to talk to you again sometime soon. I hope so. So where can people find you if they want to reach out to you online or follow you on Twitter or anything like that? Yeah, well, I'd say the best place to start is go to my Facebook fan page, which is um, Paul T. Taylor at Popo Herman. That's P-O-P-O-H-E-R-M-A-N. Long story there. I won't go into it. And then I'm the real Paul T. Taylor on um, Twitter. I have an Instagram account. They're all linked. But I also have a website that is PaulTTaylor.com. All right. Well, thank you once again, Paul, and we hope to talk to you again real soon. Okay, me too. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Wander. All right. Thanks, Paul. My pleasure. If you like this video, then please hit that subscribe button. Due to recent changes made by YouTube, we also encourage all of our subscribers, both new and old, to please hit that bell icon next to the subscribe button as well, so you will be notified when new videos are uploaded. Be sure to check back for news and analysis of the happenings and corporate politics behind the scenes of your favorite genre movies, as well as explorations of your favorite characters and their backgrounds and context here at Midnight's Edge.